So hello and welcome everybody once again to this webinar, The War on Ukraine Explained, here from our experts, organized by the School of Security Studies from King's College London. Um, traditionally, scholars of um, the Defense Studies Department and the Dep Def Department of War Studies gather on Tuesdays virtually at the moment for what we call strategic Tuesdays. And in this context, we discuss questions of foreign policy, grand strategy, um, world order, conflict and war. And when our colleague Ofer, who is also on this call here, suggested in very early January that we could do a meeting on Russia, nobody of us anticipated that we would hold a virtual roundtable in the face of a new war in Europe. February 24th has for sure um, created a watershed moment for European defense, for international security, and uh, many pundits did indeed not see this coming. And that is what leaves us, um, as well as publics um, around the world, with many questions, um, with uncertainties, but um, luckily, although our political solutions for the conflict are not on the table today, we have uh, put together a great panel of experts here from the Defense Studies Department and the Department of War Studies from King's College London, who will provide us with some insights um, on all these questions. Most importantly, how did it get to there? How could the situation escalate in the way it is escalating today? And also, um, what does it mean for us, for international security, um, for the future of the conflict, and also how can we move on from here. Um, so once again, I'm delighted to be joined here um, by my co-chair, uh, Zeno Leoni, um, as well as seven great speakers uh, from the School of Security Studies. And um, without further ado, we are going to kick it off here. Just a very quick remark, um, this webinar is on the record, and uh, whenever you want to ask questions, please feel free to do so to, uh, through our Q&A function. Um, now that we are um, starting this virtual roundtable, um, a first section will focus on key takeaways from different perspectives. And we are going to kick it off with um, Dr. Olga Friedman, who is a senior lecturer in war studies um, and focuses on Russian strategy. So over, over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and uh, everybody uh, welcome. Uh, I was asked uh, to speak about uh, Russian strategy, uh, and uh, unlike many experts who have been commenting on all different uh, news channels for the last uh, uh, week and a half, or actually two weeks already, uh, I would like to take a different approach. Uh, everybody is trying to say what we know, what, uh, what is going on, how is it been proceeding. I will try to reverse it around and actually focus on what we don't know. So we don't know what is the strategic plan of Putin. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, uh, anyone's speculation of any expert is as good as any, uh, anyone else. We don't know what is the strategic goal. And most importantly, we, do, we don't know how does it go so far. The only thing that we do know, if we can see the progress of the troops on the ground, we can uh, uh, see their slow progress indeed, but uh, to assess whether it goes well or not, whether it goes according to the plan or not, whether it put in achieving his goals or not, we need to know his goals, plans, and so on, which we don't know. We kind of uh, uh, assumed, uh, we were bought into the narrative that Russians uh, uh, stuck in the mud, they don't progress well, uh, and so on. We don't know what was their plan to start with. The only way to kind of try to assess their progress is to try to compare their progress to progress in uh, similar operations, or at least on, uh, uh, on a similar scale, not necessarily maybe conducted by Russians. Uh, and the closest operation that comes to mind in an attempt kind of to assess uh, it's the invasion of Iraq in 2003. It was the same operation on the same scale, more or less. Amer uh, American-led coalition was uh, consists of uh, almost 180,000 troops, which is more or less the same size as uh, a Russian force. 
and the balance of power between the uh, US-led coalition and Iraqi forces and the balance of power uh, between uh, Russian forces and Ukrainian forces, more or less the same. It's a significant imbalance in favor of the uh, invader. But this is where this comparison ends because, well, Iraq is almost 20% smaller than Ukraine. The Americans enjoyed uh, airstrike preparations, which Russians didn't do. Uh, the defenders' morale of Iraqi forces was very low, while Ukrainians' uh, morale is very high. The invaders' morale uh, of American army was very high, uh, while the morale of the Russian army, we can put it between medium and low. Now, obviously, American, in this comparison, American invasion, uh, uh, the invader uh, enjoyed much better conditions than the Russians. And still, it took five weeks and four days until uh, 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 the end of the invasion. And also, it took between 4,000 to 7,000 civilian casualties. So, uh, and Russians, obviously, not in the same favorable positions as Americans were in Iraq. So we somehow convinced ourselves that Russians uh, uh, planned to uh, march across Ukraine in three, four days. And after 11 days where they didn't uh, uh, stick their flag in, in the Kiev, we all assumed this does not go according to the plan. Well, we don't know what was the I think we have a problem with the sound here. Hmm? Yeah, can you hear me? Now again, I yeah. think we just lost connection for a second. Uh, uh, I think we need to take a, a step back for a moment and acknowledge that we don't know much more than we think we know. Four minutes. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you very much. And that is a perfect um, transition. We don't know much more than we think we know. But nevertheless, we have to deal with um, the consequences for um, NATO, for allies. And that um, leads us to our next speaker, Sophia Rigby, who is a PhD student at the Defense Studies Department and will um, provide us with some insights and takeaways um, from the conflict on the balance of power. Um, thank you. Um, I'm going to focus uh, more on the political. Um, so Russia has always said that it views NATO as a hostile alliance and, alliance and a, a threat to its own security, um, believing that a sphere of influence is necessary to protect their security and ensure a balance of power between them and NATO that is favorable to them. Um, NATO doesn't consider this a legitimate conception of the international order anymore um, or consider themselves an actual threat to Russia. Um, they believe that more of a sphere of democracy, if you like, um, protects security. Um, there is therefore a fundamental difference um, in how the international world is viewed, um, how it should work, um, and it doesn't look like that is changing anytime soon. Um, Russia cannot be allowed to run roughshod over its neighbors' desires, but neither can we ignore the reality um, in which we have to work. Um, refusing to acknowledge Russia's concerns doesn't make them go away. Um, so when um, policy needs to, if policy is to be effective, it needs to understand, we need to understand the, concept, uh, the context in which it has to operate. Um, and I think, to be honest, up until now, the balance of power in that respect has rested in Russia's favor because there is a clarity over Russia's position, um, NATO perhaps less so. Um, and I think we need to consider that the political cannot be separated so much from the economic and from the social. Um, perhaps after Crimea, um, Putin assumed that it, if it had been a quick operation, um, it would not have faced particularly um, severe response from the West. Um, so I think this has highlighted um, weakness in the West in, in how it responds to attacks on the international order from non-democratic -dem states. 
um, and shows that we need to look at dependencies, um, look at our supply chains and exports, um, where our values are not shared or abided by. Um, and I think we need to strengthen regulation, particularly around finance and slaps, so um, strategic lawsuits against public participation. So um, like Catherine Belton facing um, lawsuits for her book, um, Putin's People, um, in order to ensure political credibility so that um, um, credibility then comes from consistency in that um, values that are presented by the West are um, stood by and they are promoted and supported as well. So, short and sweet, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Sophia, for these um, insights and this um, more global perspectives. And whenever we are discussing um, global balance of power, there's one elephant in the room that we haven't mentioned yet, um, which is China. And um, the question of how um, China can potentially flip um, this balance of power, or even um, as it was discussed over the last days, potentially intervene. So um, with that, I turn it over to our Dr. Natasha Kurt, who is a lecturer in international peace and security at the De Department of uh, War Studies and focuses on exactly the question of Russia-China relations. So we are very keen to hearing your insights um, on that question, Natasha. Thank you so much. Yeah, the dragon in the room, I guess. Um, so um, this is a very interesting time for Russia-China relations and I think a very difficult time for them, um, a testing time. Um, China, um, I think, is on the horns of a dilemma in, in a way um, because really the um, Russian aggression, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, we don't know, there's a lot of speculation about whether, um, you know, Putin said, uh, whether, uh, sorry, Xi said to Putin, please, can you hold off until the Olympic Games have finished? I mean, I think the timeline doesn't really matter, but the point is whether Xi had advanced warning um, of this invasion, and I'm not going to speculate about that. Um, but um, I certainly um, think that um, the fact that Beijing abstained, China abstained on the motion at the United Nations on uh, condemning Russian aggression in Ukraine um, is significant. Um, obviously, it couldn't really vote against the motion, but um, you know it didn't veto uh, the resolution. Um, and this is consistent with Chinese um, behavior, really. If you go back to 2008, um, you know when um, South Ossetia and Abkhazia declared independence in the wake of the Georgian War. Um, you know, China um, refused to recognize the independence of those two entities. And then further in 2014, um, you know, China also, um, you know, had a very muted kind of reaction. And again, it abstained on um, condemning the annexation of Crimea in a United Nations Security Council um, resolution. Um, China since then has not given any explicit recognition to Russia's incorporation of Crimea. Um, so um, for some people, this somehow um, now today, when we look at uh, what Russia is doing in Ukraine, um, for some people, this is um, very important in terms of Taiwan. What lessons does China take away um, regarding Taiwan? Um, I mean, I think the two situations have very different dynamics, um, you know, and there's no um, kind of inevitability really about um, events in Taiwan. Um, but obviously China may be looking quite closely at the way that this plays out militarily for Russia. Um, so Russia, um, as we've already heard from, um, from others, Russia um, has got quite bogged down um, you know, militarily and it hasn't really secured the kind of swift victory that um, maybe it was expecting. Um, so this is also very interesting for China to see because I think after Syria, you know, China kind of viewed Russia as sort of, you know, back on the stage as a fighting force. Um, you know, Russia was projecting global military power. Um, so, um, you know, that could make China more cautious as well about um, doing anything. 
um, on Taiwan. Um, although I do think the events, uh, the situations are not necessarily um, identical. Um, there's an issue around um, also the kind of durability, if you like, um, the robustness of their relationship, quasi alliance, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, the, the sanctions on Russia are clearly far reaching, um, you know, and given uh, the kind of close friendship between the two, one would perhaps assume that China would come to Russia's aid. Um, but so far, there's not much um, sign of anything like that. On the other hand, um, you know, China might be able to get more concessions from Moscow economically. Um, I'd also suggest um, that, you know, China will probably be more likely to go along with sanctions, um, but also sanctions on Russia make life difficult for China. So, um, you know, in many ways, um, I don't think that this um, invasion um, is good news for China and it's not good news for the relationship. Thank you very much, Natasha, uh, for these insights um, from China. And um, with, with that, we're turning back um, a bit more to a Russian perspective and um, what it basically means um, in terms of, or what can be taken away from that um, from people who are working on strategic uh, culture of Russia. And with that, um, I'm very happy to introduce Elena Grossfeld, who's a PhD student at the Department of War Studies and works on strategic culture of Soviet intelligence. So um, we are keen to uh, hear from you on what this basically means and what has to be taken away from your perspective. Thank you. Um, so uh, in terms of Russian intelligence, uh, I think we cannot, of course, say definitively because we don't have the documents. But from what we're able to see on social media and being reported in the news, um, Russia is facing some issues with its intelligence. And on the tactical level, we saw it manifested in several failed operations, for example, to capture the airport. Um, they were not aware of the Ukrainian forces and assets that are going there. Um, and as a result, suffered significant casualties. And on the operational level, we uh, see that they underestimated both the Ukrainian army's preparedness uh, and the Ukrainian citizens' willingness to fight. And uh, um, despite it being a second week of uh, the Russian war, you could say, uh, Ukraine still retains uh, its major part of its air force and is able to operate and attack Russian convoys and inflict significant damages. So if it was an intelligence failure, and of course we cannot say it for sure, but indications point to that, uh, what were the reasons for that? Is it because Russia was failing at collection of data? For example, their human intelligence efforts failed um, and to that, there were rumors of uh, an investigation starting in Russia, uh, checking what happened to the almost $5 billion that were spent on uh, collection efforts in Ukraine since 2014, or it could be uh, because of inappropriate or missing um, Russian satellite coverage because it's so much lower than in US and they do not enjoy the same access to commercial satellite uh, options. Or it could be a problem of the intelligence analysis, because as we know, up until the 80s, the Soviet intelligence did not have any analytical function and were required to provide raw data. Um, um, to that point, uh, there is now a letter supposedly leaked from an FSB analyst, and I think it was yesterday also published at Times, that claims that um, the intelligence analysis in Russia currently is uh, both inadequate in terms of the policymakers do not provide um, the conditions that they expect to operate within, but also the intelligence analysts are encouraged to provide answers that the policymakers or their superiors want to hear. Uh, alternatively, it could be a problem of the policymakers. They might not ask the right questions of their intelligence organizations. Uh, 
or the intelligence organizations do not have access to the policymakers. And we still don't know who makes decisions within Russia, whether it's President Putin himself or there is an opaque group of uh, advisors who, who uh, participate in that. But we all saw the very public humiliation of Narishkin, who is the chief of SVR, that was televised in uh, the Security Council meeting when there was a decision about the Donbass area. The FSB chief, who is uh, also a former KGB officer, reportedly has a good relation with Putin. But again, there is, it's not a structure that we can see as in United States, where there is a single uh, a party that is responsible on aggregating and analyzing. Uh, the intelligence. So it is unclear why it happened, but it will be very interesting to investigate. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elena. And that um, is basically closely linked to what we started this webinar with, uh, the question that there are many things that we do not know, and uh, apparently also that Russian intelligence does not, not know. Um, taking into that, we are now zooming out a bit again. Um, and looking a bit at the regional perspective, uh, more precisely uh, on the Black Sea. And um, with that, um, I'm turning it over to uh, Dr. Deborah Sanders, who is a reader in Defense and Security Studies at the Defense Studies uh, Department and focuses um, on maritime security issues in the Black Sea. Thank you so much. And um, it's clear that the war Russia is fighting isn't the war they wanted or expected or as we've seen, planned for. Where Russia has had some success, however, is on the south coast of Ukraine. Although Ukrainian resistance is notable here, as well as in major cities, so it's not been a walk in the park. Given that Russia has seized huge swathes of Ukraine's coastline, what does this mean for the Black Sea? Is what I'm gonna talk about. Well, focusing on Ukraine, what does this mean for Ukraine? Well, it's clear that Ukraine has lost the Sea of Azov. In many ways, this was always a minimum that Russia was going to accept from this war. Over the last few years, Russia has engaged in aggressive action to limit Ukraine's access to the Sea of Azov, from building a bridge um, across from Crimea, to imposing an inspection regime on all Ukrainian commercial vessels transiting the Kirsch Straits, to actually attacking and capturing Ukrainian Navy sailors. Russia has long wanted a land bridge linking Crimea to Russia, and now it has one. The loss of um, access to the Sea of Azov for Ukraine is, is quite serious. And um, there's no doubt that in particular, the loss of its key ports of Berdansk and Mariupol, depending on which way the wind blows there, will have a damaging effect on the Ukrainian economy, as Ukraine is highly dependent on the export, uh, on maritime export, and much of its grain and sunflower oil transits by sea, particularly out of these ports. These losses will, of course, affect Ukraine's ability to rebuild economically after the war. In addition, the recent demands by Russia that Ukraine accept the independence of the separatist republics of Donetsk and Lugansk, one of Russia's recent demands, will also reinforce the loss of Ukraine's access to the Sea of Azov and the loss of its commercial ports there. The constitutional border of Donetsk in particular, as opposed to the former line of contact, will include Mariupol. So if Russia seizes Mariupol, then, and, Russia, and Ukraine is forced into acceding to Russian demands, then it will lose Mariupol as a key port. Um, a second loss to Ukraine, which I think is worth mentioning as well, is the loss and the damage inflicted on its very small navy. Um, as we all know, navies are difficult and very costly to build. And Ukraine has faced many challenges rebuilding its navy since the illegal Russian annexation of Crimea in 2014. The scuttling of the Ukrainian Navy's flagship was a huge psychological blow to the Ukrainian Navy and a clear sign of the immense challenges all small navies face when confronted by large hostile powers engaged in conventional operations. Ukraine's ability to rebuild its navy will ultimately be dependent on the outcome of the conflict and what 
ceasing military action, one of Russia's other demands, and neutrality actually mean um, in practice. An additional point here is that the change in the Ukrainian constitution to enshrine neutrality, if enforced, could also have a pernicious effect on the ability of the Ukrainian government to rebuild its military power, including, of course, its maritime power. The Ukrainian Navy has benefited enormously from capacity building, most notably with the UK, the donation of maritime platforms from the US, and from the Ukrainian Navy's participation in NATO maritime training and maritime security operations. It's not clear if any of these options will be allowed under Moscow's interpretation of what constitutes a neutral state on its border. Thank you, that's my four minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for this um, perspective, and um, which is particularly timely because it helps us understand a bit more the um, strategic implications of Mariupol, particularly, and uh, the fighting that has been taking place there um, over the last uh, two or three days. So um, with that, and also with the perspective um, focusing a bit on Ukraine, we are shifting it back um, on um, by focusing on the Russian Navy um, with a perspective and the key takeaways from what we see so far um, from Ryan West, who is a PhD student at the Department of War Studies. Thank you very much. So uh, most of my uh, research focuses on the Russian Navy. And as part of that, I spend a lot of time reading uh, what uh, academics and, and Russian Naval officers are saying internally as they debate these concepts back and forth. And so I'd kind of like to start there today. Uh, one thing that I found remarkable as we've looked at what's going on in Ukraine is how consistent Russian messaging has been over the past 20 to 30 years. Uh, they've been very consistent in their complaints about NATO expansion. And this really goes back, uh, much like Ofer was talking about, to a study of the uh, Iraq invasion and, and even further back to the, the Gulf War in 1991, where the Russian uh, academics have, have really looked at the way that NATO uh, engages in warfare and one of the first things they've seen is that in the NATO way of war, as they see it, the first step is always long range missile strikes to, de to uh, decapitate command and control structures and, uh, and leadership in the capital city. And as uh, Russia's looked at this, especially in light of the INF Treaty coming apart recently, they're starting to see major vulnerabilities if NATO is able to move troops into Ukraine and Eastern Europe to where they could range uh, some of these command and control facilities in Moscow. So this has really driven a lot of the Russian thinking as to why they need a buffer state. And a lot of it goes back to uh, Valery Gerasimov in 2019, wrote a very excellent article where he talked about the concept of active defense, where he looked at uh, the way that Russia had waged war in the past by giving ground until they were ready to turn uh, to offensive operations, uh, something in line with what Svechin would have talked about with the strategy of annihilation. And he's now calling this the follow on to that, which is active defense. Uh, the idea that when uh, Russia sees that they're about to be attacked, that they need to attack first. Uh, that explains a lot of what we're seeing today. Uh, some of it is also economic. Uh, one thing I've, just to build a little bit on what Deborah was talking about, there are some very significant operational level uh, issues across the, the uh, Ukrainian uh, Black Sea coast. Uh, first is, is Kherson. Uh, that's where the canal that provides water to uh, Crimea is located. That was a major uh, objective of the push through Southern Ukraine to make sure they could turn the water back onto Crimea so they can grow crops again. The other things to watch are around the city of Mykolaiv. That's where the Soviet uh, large dry docks were located where they built the Kuznetsov aircraft carrier. Right now, Russia does not have the capability in the North Fleet to build large surface combatants. Um, the capturing those, those big uh, shipyards at Mykolaiv uh, would allow them possibly, depending on, on what, uh, how many people stick around and, and what condition the equipment is in, but would give them the opportunity to start looking at larger building projects. Uh, additionally, we've also seen that uh, prior to 2014, Russia was importing all of their marine diesels and gas turbine engines from the Ukraine as well. Uh, that was cut off as part of the post-Crimea uh, invasion uh, sanctions. And Russia's had a very, very difficult time uh, building up their naval power in the wake of that. Uh, they lack the dry docks, they lack the engines. Uh, they lack much of the technical capability to build the kind of Navy that they would like to have to compete with NATO in the West. Uh, so it, it's uh, very significant as we watch this Southern push uh, as they're trying to get toward uh, Odessa to look not just at the cities they're trying to take, but the industries that they're uh, trying to grab at the same time 
whether that's from the nuclear power plants that we're seeing in the southern part of the Ukraine, uh, down to a lot of the industry from the Donbass and across that coast. Uh, there will be a lot of very significant moves coming up in the, the near future that uh, I'm going to be watching very carefully, and I know most of you will as well. Uh, but it, it is worth considering that uh, these are very rational uh, objectives that Russia is going after here, and they're doing it for rational reasons in their mind uh, in defense of the motherland. I think that's about my four minutes, so thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. And um, that um, idea that there are rational objectives and rational um, ideas um, that guide um, Russia's action here um, are the perfect transition um, to our last speaker here on this uh, round table um, for the um, input, who is Professor Tracy German, reader in conflict and security on the defense studies department. And we are particularly delighted uh, to have her join here, not only because of her outstanding expertise on Russian foreign and security policy, but also because um, Professor Tracy German is the first female professor in the defense studies department, which is worth mentioning not only on International Women's Day. So thank you very much, Tracy, um, for joining us. And over to you um, for a perspective, wrapping up um, everything that we heard, um, or rather giving further perspective on how we can understand what is happening from a perspective um, focusing on Russian foreign and security policy. Thank you. Um, I'm going to circle back to what a couple of people have talked about. Um, Ofa started talking about what we don't know and raised Iraq 2003. And, and Ryan also has you know, mentioned Russian observations of Western interventions. And a lot of my research in the last couple of years has focused on Russian views of the character of conflict and what's changing. And I've been immersed in some rather pessimistic literature, the, the Russian military theoretical literature over the last few years, kind of trying to understand the lessons that they've been drawing, particularly from Western interventions. And I think it's really interesting because obviously there's so much we don't know about what Russian intentions were and are with regards to its operation in Ukraine. But I think what we can see is this kind of big gap between theory and practice because the, the, the Russian military theorists have been very focused on long range precision strike um, and what um, it's seen the West trying to do in uh, Serbia in 1999, in Iraq, Afghanistan, and this belief that that is how actors go about um, seeking to achieve their objectives and trying to fight at distance. And I think what we saw in the first day or so of um, Russia's in invasion was actually an attempting to put that in practice, but clearly that has not gone to plan at all. Um, and I think it, what we've then seen is them circling back uh, to more tried and tested methods. Um, and obviously over the last couple of decades, we've seen Moscow's readiness and willingness to use the military lever in pursuit of its strategic objectives, everything from um, Chechnya, Georgia, and Syria, um, where we've seen them very happy to use military power um, and force when they, they feel it's necessary in pursuit of both strategic and, and foreign policy objectives. Very interestingly, Sergei, Sergei Shoigu, the Russian defense minister, um, claimed back in 2019 that the Russians had learned to fight in a new way in Syria. Um, and I, I get this sense that they were quite confident um, about their performance in Syria and that they felt that um, this first power projection operation moving forward was, was very positive for them. And obviously, um, what we've been seeing over the last week kind of has perhaps undermined some of those conclusions that they've reached. Obviously, moving forwards um, it remains to be seen really what um, they seek to do but they're clearly suffering some problems in kind of areas where they've often had problems in the past, such as logistics, troop failure, um, and air superiority. And 
for me, it's it's almost like going back to what I wrote my PhD on um, in the 90s and, and the, the first invasion of Chechnya. And there's an awful lot of echoes there um, in terms of what we've been seeing in the last couple of days. So I'm going to end with, you know, starting where Ofer started in this, what we don't know. Um, and there's still an awful lot, I think, that is very unclear with regards to what they're exactly seeking to achieve um, and what Putin hopes to get out of this. Thank you very much, um, Tracy, for wrapping it up and kind of bringing us back uh, to the starting point. But um, thank you very much also for all the speakers for your kickoff remarks. And um, what we see here is um, that we basically have a lot of known unknowns and um, that we now know where we have to uh, dig deeper. And that is exactly what we are going to do now during our Q&A. And with that, um, I'm handing it over to Zeno Leoni, who is co-moderating this um, webinar with me and will now take your questions. So if you want to ask questions, please feel free to use the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen and our speakers will do the very best to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Yesine, uh, for your fantastic moderation. Thanks everyone for being here. It was great to listen to you so far. Um, so I have tried to very quickly to group um, lots of the questions that have come through. Hopefully, uh, by the end of the session, uh, I will have had a, ch a chance to ask at least a question to each speaker. That's my endeavor, certainly, for the next uh, 40 to 45 minutes. Uh, and perhaps we could uh, start again from the unknown, as, as it was said. And I was wondering whether here Tracy and perhaps um, offer who alluded to that, um, talking about the, the, the political uh, end state. Um, so there's various questions here asking, what would be the best end game scenario for Russia? Um, what is the medium term prognosis for its occupation of Ukraine? Um, how will it manage and incorporate Ukraine? So essentially, I guess the question is, even if Russia was to win the uh, military conflict, what's next? Uh, tracing and perhaps offer it, it feel like, and if there is anybody who feels that uh, really should, should needs to answer this question, please just come in. We are here to listen to your thoughts. Sorry, Dina, do you want me to get Trace. first? Yeah, please. Um, so obviously Russia's stated um, end state, it would like to see a neutral Ukraine as they term it. Um, and essentially it wants a sovereign state to um, agree to not um, seek NATO EU membership and to um, fit in with Russia's um, foreign policy aims, it's, you know, this sense of needing a um, sphere of influence where, as um, Russia would see it, its kind of interests are privileged over those of others, including some of these states we're talking about. And I think um, it, with regards to political victory, that is very, very different to a, a military victory. Um, and even if, and I think it's still a big if um, Russia manages to secure a military victory. Securing a, a political victory um, with regards to Ukraine now, I think is going to be incredibly difficult. Um, and, you know, these stated objectives um, puts out, you know, when it goes into these um, ceasefire talks are completely unacceptable to the government in Kyiv. Uh, Thank you. Tracy Offer, yes, please. Uh, yeah, I would like to uh, make a small intervention here and just remind everyone uh, what is going on this conflict. It's not about Ukraine, right? Ukraine is instrumental here. And the goals that the Kremlin has been trying to achieve 
a much beyond Ukraine, right? Uh, uh, and here we also need to think for a moment uh, uh, what the Kremlin was trying to do uh, is to reshift the European or maybe global security arrangement. And to the extent he already achieved that in terms of the global security arrangements have changed. There is no way back. Probably it's not in the direction that he wanted, <laughs> but the system has been shaken. There is no way back from that. So when we're talking about what next to Ukraine or whatever victory, or again, we need to understand, which we don't know. And it's not known unknowns, it's unknown knowns. These are things that I don't know, but somebody does and I'm telling. Uh, Putin knows what he was uh, want to achieve, right? And there are several levels of here, and we need to uh, take kind of a higher view on what is going on. For the West, it has always been about defending the principles of liberal democracy and freedom and so on. For Russia, it has always been, well, always, for the last 20 years, it's about changing the global uh, or regional at least, security arrangement with expansion of NATO and so on and so on. These goals from Russian perspective, the changing the, the framework has been achieved. There is, no, uh, there is no way back. Let's hope it's uh, not in the direction that Putin hopes. And it doesn't seem that it goes in the direction that he hoped. So uh, also kind of considering other things that we've been said here about the tactical miscalculations and intelligence, I think the greatest miscalculation on the, on the strategic level, it's not about whether the plane was shot down here or whether it, it took a few more days to take Mariupol. It's about the grand strategic miscalculation uh, about the reaction uh, of the West and how the West took the initiative to navigate the new arrangement in its own direction. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Offer. Uh, Deborah, where were you going to add yes. anything I can see? Ah, right, yes. Um, on the issue of end states or, or political objectives that um, Putin is looking to achieve, I, I think it's very difficult um, to try and work out. And even if we had a, an extensive interview with President Putin, I'm sure he would come up with very many different explanations. But I don't buy the explanation that actually this is about stopping Ukraine's uh, progress towards NATO. And I think that we've got to be very careful not to take that lesson away because that will have strategic ramifications in how we respond to other states like Georgia or Moldova um, or other states that seek NATO membership. It seems very clear to me that actually Putin was threatened by the non-existent prospects of Ukrainian membership of NATO. Ukraine was at no point closer to joining NATO prior to the Russian invasion than at any other point since 1997 when President Kuchma signed the distinctive partnership which actually moved Ukraine closer to NATO. Or in 2002 when President Kuchma said that actually Ukraine had declared its intention to join NATO. Ukraine had made progress in terms of interoperability with NATO, but it was no closer to NATO membership. Even in 2008, when President Bush was very favorable towards Georgia and Ukraine being given a membership action plan, that did not take place. So I, I really don't buy into the whole idea that this was about um, stopping Ukraine's move towards NATO. I think I'm probably more in favour of what um, Lord George Robertson was saying, was that this was about curtailing democracy in Ukraine. This is about stopping Ukraine's move towards the West. This is the holding up a mirror and how this reflects on Russia and Putin's concern about the development of civil society and the development of democracy in Ukraine. I'm sorry, in Russia, and then further in the near abroad, and the threat that that posed to his regime and also his, I suppose, his policies going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. And um, Offer was mentioning that the security landscape is changing. I wonder whether uh, that's an allusion also to the, how the military expenditures are, have been going high 
uh, in Germany. I wonder whether this will have implication for uh, you know a military union in, in Europe. But I think this is for the for another webinar. And Deborah, you discuss, you just mentioned NATO. There were quite a few questions on this, which perhaps perhaps I can throw at Sophia Ryan and eventually if you like adding anything, please do, do join them. Um, there were various questions. One was, um, is NATO sending, uh, sorry, let's start from the most important one. Are Russia's concerns legitimate, uh, which is what, what Deborah was um, discussing, or this is just an excuse? Perhaps, perhaps we can hear more from Sophie and Ryan on that. And also, is NATO sending the wrong message and creating false expectation uh, in Ukraine, ex uh, promises that uh, won't be delivered? Um, yeah, I can go on that if, yeah. Yeah, please, yeah. Um, I think you can have legitimate concerns, um, but that doesn't make the action legitimate. Um, so, you know, Russia has spoken about its various security concerns in Europe, um, but, you know, the the NATO Russian Council, NATO Russia Council, that was suspended after Crimea, you know, it was their action that that stopped that. It, it wasn't sort of a threat that NATO was posing in the same way, sort of, you know, number of forces in Europe, it was it was Russia who left that treaty. Um, so while I think you can argue that, you know, states do have um, security concerns and, you know, no state wants to see a massive army on their border, um your actions then contribute to that um and or, you know take away from that legitimacy because if if russia was threatened by the idea of nato troops on its borders um i don't quite see the rationale with the solution to that is massive troops on ukraine's borders um so yeah that would be that would be my response to that mm -hmm. Thank you, Brian. So I, I have a little bit of a different take on that. Uh, again, going back and looking at what Russians are saying internally, um, there is a long history of Russia being invaded by everybody in Europe and Asia. Uh, when you go on the streets of St. Petersburg, you can walk down the main street is named after Alexander Nevsky who defended against the Teutonic Knights. I used to live on Marshal Zhukov Street, you know, the great defender in the great patriotic war. This is a constant reminder of the outside world is out to get us. And, and I hate using these tropes of, of a national or a collective uh, psyche uh, or fear. Uh, but you do see that fear inside the uh, military uh, organizations, that they look very carefully and say, we could be overrun at any time. Um, they are very clear worrying about missile strikes. They're worried about NATO getting too close. And really, it's about these precision guided munitions. You see that a lot. When you're talking, whether you're talking Bogdanov and Shekinov, whether you're talking about what Gerasimov is writing, uh, these are very common thoughts and, and feelings that they have. So when I look at, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the key things I think that has led to where we are today was the breakdown of the INF Treaty. This idea that not only could NATO get closer, but they could get closer with precision guided munitions. Um, I've, uh, I've talked a lot about Crimea as being the key to controlling the Black Sea where uh, NATO ships carrying Tomahawk or long range precision strike weapons could range Moscow. Uh, the same is true of Kaliningrad on the Baltic Sea. They're trying to build up this defensive perimeter to keep these weapons that they see as being decisive in the initial period of war as far from Moscow as they can. And these ideas, as you've started to see, uh, especially after uh, the, the Maidan re uh, revolution of pivoting toward the West, of joining the European Union, all these little turns are opening Ukraine up to become a possible place where NATO forces could, if not part of NATO, they could exercise there or cooperate there in bilateral agreements with the Ukrainians. So from the Russian point of view, they saw this as a very, very distinct and very real threat. So I would say that these, these, um, these concerns are legitimate and Putin's actions are rational, uh, even if they don't necessarily look that way from the West. Is there any uh, any further point from from the panel on this? I understand we we still have a bit of time and understand that these are important questions and also on the on the aspect of whether um, NATO is giving Ukraine is promising promising Ukraine well it's not promising 
uh, anything to Ukraine really, but it's giving Ukraine the wrong expectations. Yeah, sorry, I was using the raise sure. function, but I don't know if you can actually- Sorry, I haven't seen it, sorry. Um, sorry, I can just raise my actual hand. Um, yeah, I mean, I think um, it's a good idea also to go back to 2008 um, and think about Georgia, um, well, also Ukraine, of course, but, um, you know, I mean, that was really, I think, a lesson to Russia um, that, you know, actually, um, you know, is the West really interested in taking um, these countries in as members, um, because it seemed also um, that Russia was able to um, defeat those plans, you know, with its intervention in Georgia. Um, and so, you know, you can also look at, um, I mean, I, I'm not, I also don't really see it as being about NATO. NATO is part of it, but it's kind of part of a big bundle of different things. You know, I don't see the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine as being explicitly linked only to um, NATO enlargement, because as we've seen, you know, um, there wasn't actually um, a promise to Ukraine that they would become a member of NATO. Um, you know, they said the door is open, but, you know, there was no promise to Ukraine um, to become part of NATO. So, um, so I think, I'm, I'm not saying it's a red herring, but I just think that it's about other things as well. And partly what Ryan was just talking about, um, you know, I think um, Ukraine is a kind of prosperous, well, liberal democracy next door to Russia, um, you know, perhaps at some point part of the EU may be um, in some ways um, the more dangerous option. Natasha, maybe we can, um, we can carry on with you because one of the other questions was um, on China, which, uh, whose position you have explained already. Um, the question was specifically asking, is China able, uh, does China have the strength uh, to channel Russian um, aggression? Um, and, is, and is Russia now not more dependent on China? Well, Russia has been dependent, quite dependent on China for some time. That's nothing new economically. Um, you know, um, it's been a kind of asymmetric relationship economically, that's for sure. Um, you know, um, at the same time, obviously, Russia profits, well, a certain circle of people profit um, immensely from the oil and gas that they can sell to China. Um, you know, although that relationship, economic relationship, took quite a long time to really get going, you know, um, for a long time, it was lagging behind the political relationship. It's only really since 2014 that the um, trade and economic side of the relationship has been boosted, you know, obviously, you know, to plug the gap, um, you know, left by, um, you know, sanctions and so on after 2014 in Crimea. Um, so, um, you know, but essentially, you know, Russia has a lot of eggs in, China, in China's basket, in the Chinese basket, um, but China, you know, it has diversified its energy supply, for example. So it's not really dependent. It is dependent to some degree on Russia, but it's certainly not um, as dependent on Russia as perhaps Russia might like to think. Um, so in that sense, um, yes, um, you know, there is a certain dependence there, but there's a quite a big asymmetry in relations. And, um, you know, Russia, um, has benefited to some degree from China's rise and China has, has um, offered loans and credit to Russia, especially on energy project, projects. But um, I don't think that uh, China is a kind of all weather friend to Russia, economically speaking, and I don't really see uh, China coming to Russia's aid um, over sanctions. Uh, thank you, Natasha. Perhaps I, I also wanted to add that, I mean, the reality of states, I think, um, normally, the, you know, it's not enough for somebody in Beijing to pick up the phone and call Moscow and say, stop whatever that you're, you're doing. I, I don't think that's how it works, especially given that Ukraine is high, so much high priority. It seems to be high priority for, uh, for Putin. And we've seen how many times the US in 
you know, in the past decades, uh, was unable to um, influence as much as it wanted some of its uh, closest allies. And so I don't think the fact that China, some, I guess some, and even the US, they think that um, China is powerful, so it will have a leverage. I don't think it's so, we can make that uh, equation uh, so easily in, in an international system of states. No, and I agree. Can, yeah. I agree. Oh. Yeah, sorry, interrupted there. No, it's fine. I mean, I don't, I no, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't think there's any way in which um, Xi could really, um, I mean, he can call for restraint. That's the kind of standard Chinese position on pretty much everything really, isn't it? Um, you know, and, but they can, and they can show some kind of solidarity with Russia by, you know, they've both come out with those statements about, you know, being against colored revolutions. So they're against the umbrella revolution in Hong Kong, they're against the Maidan revolution in Ukraine and so on. So they're, and they are against, you know, Western um, sort of hegemony and megaphone diplomacy. Um, and, and, you know, China has also said NATO, um, you know, should respect the sovereignty and security and the interests of other countries, you know, and said Russia has legitimate security interests in Ukraine, but that's as far as they've gone, um, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I don't think that China has influence over Russia in that sense, but, you know, China will certainly um, not benefit from the kind of chaos that might come to global markets and so on with, you know, the sanctions, um, you know, with what is resulting from, you know, um, all of this kind of fallout really from, from the invasion. Thank you, Natasha. We shift the focus slightly and uh, wanted to throw uh, a question to Elena. Uh, about information. So two questions really. So one first question is what do you make of uh, the fact that it seems that Ukraine has been, has, has showed superiority in controlling uh, the media narrative in the West. I wonder whether it's the West that made the narrative um, uh, superior or whether actually Ukraine was, was good at, was really good at it. Uh, then, then there's a follow-up question about the cyber war, IT war. Uh, does this have any bearing on the intelligence failure Elena mentions? And what is it, what is happening in this realm? Sure. I mean, the, the cyber war or the cyber attacks that Ukraine suffered, it's really very interesting because for a number of years, since 2014 for sure and probably before, Ukrainian government organizations, businesses, and um, infrastructure were under constant cyber attacks from Russia. And even before that, you know, the, the NotPetya and, and the, the, all the fallout from that. So you would think that if uh, Russian intelligence organizations managed to penetrate Ukrainian networks so far, they would be able to at least realize uh, the preparations and the modernization efforts and all that good stuff that was ongoing in Ukraine. So I think one of the potential explanations was um, that since there are multiple intelligence organizations in Russia, and basically they're in a constant competition with each other. So in the example of the DNS penetration in the 2016 American elections, it turned out that there were multiple organizations involved in, in the hacking. So perhaps the same thing happened there. The, you know, the GRU um, managed to break into some networks and attack and wipe stuff, but they didn't update the FSB or whether the FSB did the same. You know, um, the, the internal competition between the intelligence organizations did not allow for um, effective work and effective intelligence warnings to be generated and um, to inform Russia before the invasion. On the uh, media management, Ukraine is definitely leading. And um, there are several reasons for that. So first of all, they are the underdog. Uh, so it's, you know, it's natural to sympathize with them. But another factor is that um, if you remember the 2014 downing of the Malaysian airline, and the subsequent investigation by Bellingcat that followed that allowed to uh, identify the 
book missile launcher that was involved in that all was based on the social media analysis of the soldiers and the participants. As a result of that, uh, Russia issued the law that does not allow soldiers to post social media uh, posts during um, conflicts or you know, during uh, operations. And all the Russian soldiers upon, before entering Ukraine were um, stripped of their, of their cell phones or smartphones. And that is some of the reasons that they are unable to sort of illuminate their side of the conflict. And um, there is intense uh, media war going within uh, Telegram and TikTok. But I think the only people who, most of the people who see the Russian side are within Russia and um, within the parts of Donbass, the Ukraine part that was um, predominantly uh, leaning to Russia's anyways. So I think that's my take. I think Ofer wanted to add something to that. Sure. Uh, yeah, just uh, just two uh, just two points, uh, uh, which are uh, kind of interconnected. First of all, I will be very careful to say that Ukraine is leading the narrative. So obviously, Ukraine is leading the narrative, but Russia doesn't fight in the narrative. Russians do not try to explain themselves to us. They're not trying to win over our hearts and minds. It's a kind of, Ukraine is fighting on its own and obviously winning, right? Uh, and by the way, if you go back to the Georgian war and uh, learn the le and read what lessons Russians learned in terms of information space uh, from this Georgian war, one of the lessons was, if you can't win, don't fight. Uh, and, uh, uh, and there is no war over the, uh, heart and mind of the Western audience. It's completely uh, taken by Ukrainian narrative and Russians even don't try. Now, uh, they obviously try very hard to preserve the heart and minds of their domestic population and isolated from any foreign influence, right? But uh, in, the uh, in the West, there is no fight. There is no information war between Russia and Ukraine or anybody else. Russia just don't fight. Uh, uh, and this what leads to another very interesting observation kind of connects to uh, the unknown knowns. Uh, we can say many things about Russian uh, ground forces, air forces, missile strikes, Navy. There is one uh, thing that we know for sure, they're very good in uh, uh, electronic warfare. And they're very good uh, in cyber warfare. Right, uh, there were attempts in that, and electronic warfare, which basically jumps everything. There is one thing that I, I still struggle to answer is why, and everybody was talking about that before the invasion, that the first thing that Russians will do, they will shut the information space in Ukraine. Right, they will break down, uh, break out Ukraine from internet uh, uh, and uh, uh, other services, other services, and they haven't. So on the one hand, it's kind of will be, again, go into this narrative, oh, they don't know what they're doing, oh, they're muddling in the, uh, uh, in the mad, oh, they've been surprised, might be. But maybe they want Ukrainians to galvanize the West. They want, they don't fight it. They want messages of Ukrainians about the attacks, about the images of destruction, to go to the West? We don't know. Sure, and, and, and this uh, somehow takes it back to, uh, yeah, the fact that we don't know exactly about their, uh, their, well, their end game. Um, I think we, could, we can stay on this, on this terrain because there was a question on what's the lesson for conventional and, and irregular war, warfare? Um, what does it tell us? I'd like to add, we have seen Russia uh, in 2014, perhaps, wait, not perhaps, waging a, a sort of irregular warfare, and nowadays a different kind of warfare. And so I was wondering whether there are any lessons here. Uh, offer, please, you, you go ahead, but perhaps others would like to jump in after you. What about irregular and irregular? Yeah, well, what's the lesson? Yeah. 
Uh, well, the, 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 well, the lessons we will learn lessons after the, this ends. There is a, the, the, we can we can't learn uh, we can't learn lessons now. It's too uh, it's too quick because we do, like you know lessons are learned from performance, which was either good or bad or in the, in the middle, and we don't know what was the performance because we don't know what they wanted to do. What we can say for sure that Ukrainians a perform amazingly against i think our expectations definitely they perform much better than we we expected them to perform and much better than i assume also they expect themselves to perform but we don't know how russians and expected them and they present a very difficult i would say uh, mix of regular and irregular forces capabilities methods and tactics to russians to face uh, it, of, can we say, and, and everybody else, can we say that um, is this a reminder that conventional warfare is still very much a thing nowadays? I guess that's what the question about lessons alluded to, given that uh, irregular it warfare, has, there's been a lot of debate and publication about it. has always right? been a thing. I don't understand. Like, uh, it has always been a thing. Uh, uh, it will always be a thing until the state until the states will kind of use these uh, the, these tools, right? We've been in our kind of in the Western discourse. We've been all dragged into in reinventing and inventing all these new uh, new titles of uh, you know uh, hybrid and gray zone and surrogate and uh, you know. Uh, uh, one colleague of ours from University of Reading actually made a very good analysis. There are more than 56 different names of warfare, which basically they say they're reinventing the wheel every time. So yes, conventional warfare has always been there, will always be here, and uh, you know it's okay. It's part of a part of the tools. Okay, okay. Um, I can see Tracy, Deborah, and Ellen, and they want to jump in. Uh, Please do go ahead. Um, yeah, so I, I think one of the issues we've had over the last, well, since 2014, is this real Western focus on hybrid warfare or gray zone warfare when it comes to looking at Russia. Um, and there have been a lot of people who actually you know, look at Russia saying, you really need to be focusing very much on the conventional side. Russia has never stopped focusing on its conventional forces. Um, and I think, you know, <laughs> what we've seen is that it was almost an expectation in the West that, oh, they'll, you know, it'll be sub-threshold, it'll be or a hybrid, and actually, you know, no, conventional land forces. And I, I do think, for me, it's very much this danger, um, and we see it time and again of, kind of mirror imaging, of, kind of imposing our own frame, frameworks, templates, thought templates on adversaries, and I think we need to be very careful about that indeed. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, Deborah. Thank you. Yes, a similar point in many ways. I think um, despite the emphasis on grey zone, hybrid warfare, it's, it's become very clear that actually conventional military strength, particularly at sea, thinking about the maritime domain, uh, as well as on land, is the real currency of deterrence and the real currency of the future. And it's a lesson I think that we're forgetting or we have forgotten. And Germany seems to have... Um, reminded itself of the need to spend 2% um, on defence recently. And the only effective way to deal with hostile powers is to have sufficient, I know that's a, a contentious term, but to have sufficient conventional military power. But I did want to pick up on the issue of insurgency because um, at Staff College, as, as you're all aware, um, COIN kind of went out of, in, went out of fashion after the um, rapid withdrawal um, from Afghanistan, we were moving away from studying COIN, um, counterinsurgency. Um, and I think that what we'll find as academics is that the debates around insurgencies will be reinvigorated and quite interesting. And what I would say from my knowledge of the Ukrainian armed forces um, and from how they've performed so far, um, I think that the Ukrainian armed forces and the people are not equipped or trained to fight um, an insurgent campaign. And I have legitimate concerns about that. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, the US Army Urban Doctrine says that you need, uh, Russia will need three to five times more forces to accomplish a task, such as 
uh, dealing with a counterinsurgency campaign. So we'll need to up the ante. And the extent to which the Ukrainian people are prepared um, for a counter or for an insurgent campaign, I think remains to be seen as it's extremely costly economically. Um, it damages the economy of states that are engaged in this or, or statelets that are engaged in this, destroys economies, as I said. It can take time, as we've seen with the Taliban in Afghanistan. And perhaps most importantly, it can cause huge casualties as well to the civilian population. And we only have to think back to Chechnya. Um, and Grozny and the huge casualties that resulted there, of course. And of course, the over half a million Afghans died between 1978 and 1989. So the costs to society are immense. So academically, I think it's very interesting, should the campaign um, adopt um, a, an insurgent type uh, response, but actually politically, economically, I think it's extremely costly. And I don't think the Ukrainian military or the people are prepared um, or understand perhaps the consequences of engaging in such a campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Elena. So uh, back to what Deborah was saying, I think it's quite unprecedented in the modern times for states to do what Ukraine has done when it basically started distributing arms and ammunition to citizens who are not part of the military and who is um, you know, publishing uh, recipes for the best mode of cocktails, including like the best substances and um, the um, creation of their IT cyber army that they basically said, well, if you can't fight, you know, then and you're proficient in uh, computers, can you can join our cyber forces. And they did cause damage to Russian sites, whether them or anonymous. But you know, multiple Russian governmental sites were in unresponsible, unresponsive, sorry, for several days. I do agree with Deborah that um, this type of citizenship resisting puts them at danger because um, they become part of the armed conflict, and you know, Geneva Conventions rules no longer apply because Russians, Russian soldiers will be so scared of you know civilian population that they might not. Um, honor those rules. But on the other hand, Russians have not been known for honoring those rules, even in places where the citizens were uh, not part of the military campaign. And so I think, you know, while Ukrainians probably do face a lot of uh, damage and casualties, they're still willing to um, engage in it. Thank you. Uh, Elena, sorry, uh, also the fact that some states told their citizens, you know, if you want to go and fight, um, you can, right? Uh, am I yeah. correct? In saying that, that, yes. I thought that was unprecedented as well. Right. And although they do not put it out as an official, you know, call to, to arms, they do not prevent their citizens from joining Ukrainian forces in the same way that they did with say ISIS or Al-Qaeda or other terrorist organizations. And uh, from what I understand, there is a number of both American ex-military and British ex-military and Israeli ex-military who are now uh, joining forces with Ukrainian military, perhaps not as combatants, but as medics and other support um, tasks. But nevertheless, I think it's very um, unique. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are approaching the end. I will ask you a question in a minute about, uh, well, there have been questions about World War III and uh, different sorts of questions. Uh, we will get to that one. Firstly, uh, from a colleague came in a question from Ryan, um, which is if Gerasimov was actually killed, uh, what do we make of that? And the question would be what uh, a general of, uh, of that rank was doing so close to the front uh, that he would trade uh, on a mine. Let's just be clear that we're talking about Vitali, not Valieri, right? That's what That's, I was just about to I bring so. up. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it had there's been confusion yeah. on yeah. Twitter. I've seen people tweeting, Valieri got get us some of his dead, you know. Um, so make sure we're talking about the right one. 
Yeah, so uh, like uh, like Natasha said, Valeria Gerasimov, the general, the chief of the general staff, is ensconced in a very comfortable bunker somewhere in the Urals right now. He's fine. Not related to him, Major General Vitaly Gerasimov, who was one of the deputies of the 41st Combined Arms Army, has been reported to have been killed on the front. And I get nervous talking about these unconfirmed reports, but it seems that may have been the case. And the key takeaway I, I would I would draw from that is is uh, and this this addresses a lot of the questions I've seen in the Q and A. Is, is this idea of operational art and planning and what's going on with, with the Russian high command. And what we're seeing a lot right now is some breakdowns of communication, both at the staff levels and on the front. Uh, so you probably had a general up at the front trying to get things moving again where things were stalled, meaning they're probably having some difficulties communicating back and forth uh, between the rear and between the, the elements on the front lines. Uh, we've also seen some issues with um, uh, Russian communication systems that rely on cell towers that have quit working after they blew up the cell towers, uh, which is more of a staff problem where the communications folks are not talking to those in charge of uh, choosing targets. Uh, we're seeing a lot of these, these breakdowns and, and we know that Russia is very good at operational art. Alexander Svechin invented operational art. Um, in the Western world, we take a lot of the things that the, the Russians started and we have adapted them and, and, and very successfully implemented them. Um, these, these ideas do exist, but it seems that uh, either they were uh, a little bit negligent possibly, or uh, were overly confident that this was gonna be a quick operation and did not do the due diligence uh, to some of these staff processes that probably should have been done. Uh, but the, the quick answer to that is, I would imagine this is a, a communications breakdown where things were not progressing as, as uh, desired. The commander sent his deputy forward to fix the problem. And uh, sometimes these things happen. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. So everyone, um, we are in the last entering the last 10 minutes. I, I was wondering whether we could close with, with, uh, with a question relating to World War III. It has come up a lot uh, in the narrative. I wonder whether um, it is fair to make those sort of comparisons. Um, the question from the audience was, what would it look like? How likely? Uh, what are the risks for for the UK? But probably we should think eventually beyond the. What are the risks for for citizens beyond the UK? Um, I, I guess it's the last question. So I was wondering whether I might open it to to the floor to whoever would like to jump in. And if not, if you have any further point about uh, lessons from what we've been discussing today and what we have been seeing over the last few weeks, please just feel free to to share your thoughts in a concise manner, perhaps. Um, sure, well, yeah. I can go quickly. Yeah, sure. Say, um, well, World War Three. I mean, um, I think if we have no fly zones, that could be a possibility. Um, you know, although it would be great to have no fly zones, um, I think a lot of people um, who call for those no fly zones are not completely kind of familiar with what a no fly zone actually is. And yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at Iraq and, and other cases of no fly zones, I mean, you know, we're talking about needing quite a lot of uh, military, concerted military power to enforce those, but also, you know, we had no fly zones with Bosnia, but, you know, Milosevic didn't have nuclear weapons, so this is um, quite a different scenario from that point of view. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, Deborah. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, I think that's um, uh, unlikely, to say the least. Um, I think my, I would have um, genuine concerns about Russia getting closer and closer to borders. Um, and accidents happen, um, as we've seen. I don't know whether the attack on the nuclear reactors were accidents or, or cock up, who knows? Conspiracy or cock up, who knows? Um, but I do think what's interesting about that is that the closer Russia gets to the borders with NATO states, the more risk we have of missiles hitting NATO members. And how that would be explained or justified, I think would be extremely difficult. Um, so that would be my only concern vis-a-vis -vis potential escalation of this conflict. Um, I got asked recently about Moldova and whether or not Russia would push, try and join up with Transnistria. 
um, and push into Moldova, because Moldova is also, of course, um, not a member of NATO, and whether or not that would escalate um, this conflict, pushing it into the soft underbelly of Europe. Um, and I suspect not, because I suspect, um, as a lot of my colleagues have said, the problems that Russia has faced um, in the military domain um, suggest that actually pushing further, extending its supply lines um, in its logistics, its command and control, its fire and maneuver, all of the problems that we've seen um, mean that Russia doesn't want to extend the territorial expansion any further. And whether or not um, Transnistria would um, actually support an invasion into Moldova, I think is also moot, because I think what's more likely to happen is the Transnistria elite, the government there, will recognize it's on a sweet deal. And it is on a sweet deal because the EU association agreement um, that the EU has with Moldova has a positive spillover effect in terms of Transnistria. And it will be I suspect, and willing to upset the apple cart with any very small gains that it might have with a join up of Russian backed supported territories in Ukraine joining Transnistria. Over. Deborah, sorry, very briefly, you've seen that the report about uh, Japanese commercial um, ship uh, hit by a missile in the Black Sea. But I guess. If it's a commercial ship, that you know, it doesn't lead to the implications are obviously. Smaller. I think that's one of the interesting thing is that the, many of our flagged vessels are with obscure states who, of course, aren't NATO members, which is probably a good thing. And I think it's probably too early to come out um, and uh, with a clear idea of exactly what happened there. The Ukrainians have done a great job of of spinning us, who knows, who knows what the truth is, we'll find out probably in 10 years time, um, suggesting that actually that was a Russian vessel using a commercial vessel as a means of um, attacking the shore and getting a little bit closer in. Um, I, if, if the Russians are adopting such a tactic, then it is extremely problematic because the Black Sea is heavily dependent on the transit of maritime commercial vessels in and out to supply NATO member states as well as NATO partners, thinking of Georgia and of course, Turkey. So the last thing we want to see is any attempt to curtail the movement of commercial vessels in and out of the Black Sea, over. Thank you, um, Elena, and then Offer, and I think we will uh, close, and Tracy as well, if we could have some uh, brief final conclusive points that that would be great yeah i just wanted Elena, to point yeah. Out, yeah thank you i just wanted to point out to the questions about the third world war and uh danger for other uh current um uh, nato member states is that given the operational issues that Russian military seems to be having now in Ukraine, you know, the communications failure and even the, the tire trucks and the equipment maintenance and the, I don't believe um, they have a bandwidth to turn anywhere else before regrouping and recollecting their, you know, collective uh, thoughts about it. And um, I was having a very long uh, argument with somebody. The state of Russian equipment probably points to the fact that their um, strategic and nuclear missiles and you know systems are not in any better shape than what we can see right now. So I don't know if it's <laughs> offer seems to disagree, but um, in my experience, um, the same rule applies to um, the majority of systems. So with that, I will pass on to offer. Uh, well, uh, again, I will kind of uh, come and say here, let's get free, let's free our, our mind from an assumption that Russians plan to ride of Ukraine in two, three days, right? They are, they are slowly progressing, which their slow progress is comparable to same size operations, especially taking in consideration the level of resistance that they face. They do suffer casualties. Their, uh, you know, their tires are got flat. 
<laughs> and uh, sometimes there are problems in, in, in uh, it's normal. This is how military operations on that scale look like. To expect, uh, to expect that they will ride across Kiev to Lvov in three days, it's a, pre, it's, a, it's a fruit of our imagination, right? There has never been such a speed in human history of wars, and the most comparable uh, military operation conducted the more, by the most high-tech equipped, uh, high-morale military only 20 years ago, it took five and a half weeks for a territory which was 20% less against a opponent which was twice, uh, provided twice less resistance than, uh, than Ukrainians. So this operation goes relatively okay. There are problems here and there. There are problems of supply, there are problems of communication, there are problems of coordination. It's, this is how war look like. So this is uh, the first one. The second one, uh, around the, uh, the Third World War. Uh, to say that we are going or not going to the Third World War, it's like to say, when the, the, well, let's go back to the last World War. Who, was the, who thought that uh, uh, when Germans uh, invaded Poland in September 1939, it will look like it looked like in there? Uh, definitely not the Allies, definitely not the Soviets, <laughs> and uh, definitely not Hitler himself. So we don't know. We don't know where to go. The only thing that we can see now, watching these tectonic geopolitical shifts occurring in Europe, occurring in, uh, in Russia and all uh, around Russia, with all the wave shocks that we will see in the energy costs, food costs, raw resources costs, and so on, with the supplies uh, which are going to dry of food to Africa because uh, UN food, uh, 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 food programs were buying grain from R Ukraine and Russia. Now, now they have no food to feed, uh, 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 feed Africa. Now, these are tectonic shifts. And the only, the only thing, again, without being too much uh, pessimistic here, my only kind of, uh, uh, inside or foreign side or an advice for the next few years to come is to brace brace for everyone everywhere uh, thank you thank you all for uh, although that wasn't very optimistic tracy uh, the final word on all this uh, to you yeah so actually i was going to talk about the risk of wider global instability triggered by rising prices the price of oil food Food insecurity. Let's not forget the Arab Spring, Tunisia. That was food, you know, food prices rising. Um, and I think we haven't yet begun to see the the real impact of this invasion and what it means. Um, and if there's one lesson moving forwards, we've been talking about EU reliance on Russian oil and gas. There's one issue we've not talked about, and that's EU reliance on phosphates from Russia. That's for fertilizers. Um, and it's a really huge issue that is not being tackled. Um, and I think moving forwards, these are, you know, they're well, known unknowns. Let's, let's end with Umfra's, uh, you know, beginning framework here. But, uh, you know, I think these are much longer, kind of longer term issues that could cause huge global instability. Thank you, Tracy. Um... Unfortunately, we need to end the webinar here, but it sounds like uh, there is enough, there are enough issues and critical uh, matter to, uh, to have another one at some point uh, in the future um, on the implications of the conflict. Uh, I'll refrain from making any, any conclusion at, at this stage. It was great to listen to you. I just wanted to thank all the speakers because you have come on uh, to this webinar and talked, but at the same time, you've been really patient. Um, there, were, there were many of you and surely you refrained from uh, sharing um, more ideas that probably wanted to share. And also at the same time, I wanted to thank uh, those in the audience. Uh, it was a huge audience and um, I'm sure they've got a very comprehensive grasp of, of the current war in Ukraine. And I also uh, hope they, they 
they, they enjoy uh, their time. You, you enjoy your time with, with us. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Have a good evening. Thank you.